Abraham. Can you tell me where he got? You know, he's treated a lot of people. But I see he's a good guy. I looked around. He was gone. Anybody here? See that I might be gone. Can you tell me where he's gone? You know, he freed a lot of people. But it seems he's a good. They die young. And I looked around. He was gone. Did you know all the good that he stood for? You know, he cried and he cried and he cried to do all the good that he could for you and me that we would be free. Anybody here see my old friend? Me where they're gone. Free a lot of people, but it seems the good die young. And tell me what happened. Nobody don't know. <laughs> I looked around, I looked around, and I looked around, and I looked around. They were gone. Did you know all the good that they stood for? And they tried and tried and tried to do all the good that they could for you and me, that we would be free. Anybody here see my friend Martin Luther King? Can you tell? Where he's gone? Free a lot of people, but it seems the good died young. And tell me what happened. Tell me. I looked around, and they were gone. Did you know all the good that he stood for? And he tried, and he tried, and he tried to do all the good that he could for you and me, that we would be free. Anybody here did not free Martin Luther King? Can you tell me where he gone? He free. Shared 
in this flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still language in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. So we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architect of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unaliable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note, insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check. A check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe there are insufficient funds in the great pulse of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cash this check. A check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make the real promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate okay. valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quick stance of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. The sweltering summer of the Negroes' legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship right. The whirlwinds will revolt, continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must not for, forever conduct our struggle on high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to de degenerate into physical violence. Again and again we must raise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have came to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. They have come to realize that their freedom is in a strict blow bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. As we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking devotees of the civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negroes are victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negroes' basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. 
We can, we cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and the ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and it will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day in the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh see, shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of the spare of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that one day we will be free. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with a new meaning. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must be. True. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain, Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and every mole hill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free Jeff Adams. I'm one of the pastors here at Graceway, 
And it is my honor, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome you here on this occasion to honor the memory of Dr. Martin Luther King. There are events in life that mark us forever. I was 19 years old, traveling with a couple of friends back to college on the East Coast. It was about 8 o'clock in the evening on the 4th of April, 1968, that we entered Memphis, Tennessee, and we wondered where everybody was. The streets were deserted. We sensed that something was wrong. We turned on the radio in our car and learned what had happened just less than two hours earlier, that Dr. King had been assassinated. I, I will never forget for the rest of my life the glow of the fires in Memphis that night. I'll never forget driving all through the night and seeing convoy after convoy of National Guard troops headed for Memphis. As a 19-year-old, uh, it, it is absolutely impossible to wrap your head around the gravity of events like that that happened. And I can say that I have spent the rest of my life absorbing the impact of one life. And we're here this afternoon because in one way or another, uh, whether you're even aware of it or not, every one of our lives has been impacted uh, by the life of the man whose memory we honor today. I would like to lead us in prayer as we begin this afternoon. Dear God, we come together from all over our community, representing all of the various types of people that Dr. King mentioned on that very special day when he had a dream. And God, we realize that even though we've come a ways down the road, we have a way to go. We need your help. We need your strength. We thank you for your choice servant, Dr. King. And we pray that all of us might see the truth of Scripture exemplified in so many things that he said, and so many things that he did. And dear God, coming together from so many different backgrounds, from so many different houses of faith, from so many different perspectives of life, Lord, this afternoon we ask that you be glorified and lifted up among us as we come together to celebrate the freedom that we can have in you. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
There are certain things we expect from a mayor. We expect that he or she is honest. We expect him or her to be judicious in the use of the city's resources. We expect them to be enthusiastic boosters of civic pride. Then there are certain things that we hope from a mayor. We hope that our mayor will lead with compassion and vision. We hope that our mayor can be a unifier, someone who draws people together from all races, economic circumstances, and faith backgrounds. And we hope that our mayor helps us to be a community that rises above individual aspirations to become a community that cares for one another and creates an environment in which all people can thrive. In my opinion, Mayor David Bauer has met many of these hopes. As he completes his eight years of service as mayor to the city of Raytown, he has been both a friend and a leader, not only for me, but for everyone across the interfaith community. His annual participation in this event is but one mark of the commitment which he has to forging a community which in the spirit of Dr. King prizes hope, reconciliation, and goodwill. Now I must acknowledge, however, that the mayor and I have not always seen eye to eye on every issue, and I intend to rectify that today. Joining hands 
all of us together, the kids in the playgrounds, in our school system, in Raytown, are joining hands, they're playing together, they're getting together after school because they don't recognize a color. It's one person that we are learning to respect. No regard for color. It was wiped out by a man who at 39 years old worked to make a better world for us. And in just 12 years, the impact that he has had on us today, where those kids are playing the playgrounds together without recognition, without fear, without any consolation whatsoever, they are playing together, they are best friends, and that's what we need to have in society today. I'm way off script, I might as well throw it away. <laughs> the other thing I want to share with you, though, is it's, <laughs> that's what it's about. <laughs> I watched the dedication of my four-and-a-half-year-old grandson today at church, and I can hardly keep the, the tears back, because it, it dawned on me today, as it did Friday night when I was trying to get him to go to sleep in, in these arms of mine, he doesn't know what Martin Luther King fought for. He doesn't know. He's born into innocence in society today. It's, it's up to his parents. As a grandparent, it's my responsibility. It's your responsibilities to raise the children of today to reflect what it should be what Martin Luther King fought hard for. And that's to get along together, to be one person, one entity together for the sake of all to wipe out what, we, what Martin Luther King fought so hard for so many years ago. That's what it's about. Each of you are responsible for that. If I could uh, get back on script for a second, could I ask the uh, members of our HRC Commission, Human Relations Commission in, in Raytown, to please come forward and join me on the stage. Because as I've said, it's not just one person, it's not just several people in our city, it's a whole lot of people that make a difference. Sorry you forget your lovely wife. Come on, please. You called her your better half for eight years than I know. She should be up here with you. Would believe and say if he were alive today. 
I believe Dr. Martin Luther King would applaud our children in this community, in the school district, in our Interfaith Alliance, and all of those, all of the parents, all the organizations that stand behind these kids to teach them the right thing. I think he would applaud <coughs> what is happening in the city of Raytown. It's okay to clap. <laughs> he recognized that we live in a complicated world, but that we still must, put, we still must push forward. I believe he would remind us of his thoughts of not hating and that violence just brings more violence. He would remind us of the need to work for the preservation of family, that family need to have faith, that family need to recognize the importance of educating our youth in addition to the education system. Don't lay it on the school district if you're not involved. Fortunately, the school district in the city The school district in this city we're very proud of, and this community very proud of. Don't lay it on them unless you're involved. You've got to be involved in what's happening. Not just in our schools, you've got to be a part of what's happening in these youth's lives in their home. I believe he would remind us that we are a people to recognize the possibilities of this nation, and that there is no challenge that we cannot surmount together. He loved that we lived in a country that people are allowed to use their voice to create change, to speak their mind, to disagree, and to look for the common ground. He recognized that there are many countries, even still today, that do not allow this to happen. We do in the United States. Let us mark today by answering Dr. King's call to service, by helping each of us reach the dream of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As he said many times, our destinies are intertwined. What happens to one affects others. Let us embrace the belief that we share a common purpose, accept our obligation to be good, and just to each other. Work towards strengthening the bonds that hold us together in the most diverse nation on earth. It is a privilege today, as I've had the honor to do for the last seven years, to deliver a proclamation on behalf of the citizens of the city of Rayton and on behalf of our Board of Aldermen. Whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy to society is the leadership he provided by his commitment to justice, equality, and the elimination of racism through nonviolent social change. Whereas Dr. King strengthened the civil rights movement by building upon the actions of grassroots activism, which focused on the elimination of barriers faced by people of African descent to achieve an inclusive society that embraced the differences among all people. Whereas we must face the challenges of today with the same strength, persistence, and determination exhibited by Dr. King, guided by the enduring values of hope and justice embodied by other civil rights leaders. Whereas the people of Raytown, Missouri, are in the forefront of efforts to establish a caring and compassionate society based on the elimination of all forms of discrimination, we must recognize that the fundamental strength of our community is our diversity and celebrate that diversity in our community. Our ability to work together towards a common goal of peace and unity is dependent upon that. The residents of Raytown, Missouri honor Dr. King's memory each year with a day of remembrance in January to reaffirm our commitment to the basic principles of human rights, equality, and justice. Now I, therefore, David Bauer, the proud mayor of the city of Raytown, does sign this proclamation in honor and recognize Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and ask all citizens of the city of Raytown, Missouri, to join in celebrating his life and his work on this day. I'm going to give this proclamation to someone that in my mind epitomizes what we're all about in this city. He was an alderman. He was our first alderman. First black alderman. He's a man that I've looked up to for the last eight years 
I will tell you I did not know this man nor his wife before I came into office. But every time I see them on the street or in an event such as this, it reminds me that they, this couple, are pillars of our community for what they stand for, for what they have lived through themselves, and what they will continue to bring to all of us in our community, that we are one. We are together. Cliff Sargent, otherwise known as Sarge, I've signed this the 18th day of January, kind sir, on behalf of the citizens of Ray County. From his first public speech at the age of 15, titled The Negro and the Constitution, to his final speech, I've been to the mountaintop, that he gave to a packed field Mason Memorial Church of Memphis, Tennessee on the night before his tragic assassination. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. not only spoke, but modeled the healing healthy universal values necessary for human well-being, peace, and unity. Coming up next are two videos of two dynamic, distinct organizations that, in my opinion, live out and communicate Dr. King's dream and vision. And as the Holy Writ says, faith without works is dead. The first one is from the community, is talking about the community outreach. The second, the Raytown Emergency Assistance Program. These two organizations are a few that make up the front line of service to the citizens of our community. And I only take a spot to get a fire going. Anyone that needs help can come and ask. We try to help them. That's community really outreach. <laughs> service to the people. You know, I'm 88, coming up March 23rd, and it seems like I've been doing this all my life. Outreach is my job, giving the gift from God to serve people. There was a, a mother with seven or eight children that didn't have any food or hardly a place to live and needed help. And that's where we just started to help this person out of community outreach with bond. There is a need. There, there are people that are hungry. There are people that are homeless. There are people that don't have clothing. The winter time's coming. There are people that don't have coats. And so we need help from everybody that's able to help to get the job done. It's, that's what it's all about. So I reach out calling for help, to help somebody. We do need donations. Sometimes we say, oh, nobody don't need, but yes, people do need. Even in the day like today, the day like we are living in now, there are people that don't have anything. And if I don't have it, I find out who has it and pass it on. That's what the community is all about. You want to spread his love to everyone and you want to pass it on. Can you help me now? Pass it on. Pass it on. Pass it on. I'll shout it from the mountain top. I want the world to know that the Lord of love has come to me and I want to pass it on. That's what it's all about, it's passing on love. Yes,
Inspired by witnessing a heartbreaking situation, in 2009, John Wiley founded River of Refuge, a nonprofit Kansas City based organization committed to helping working families, working homeless families, transition from run down, high rent motels into permanent, more affordable, family friendly housing. Today, John shares the story of his continuing journey to assist this unique niche of the homeless population as a dynamic and passionate speaker for audiences of all kinds. Now John is also an ordained Foursquare pastor and is the current divisional superintendent for the Kansas City Metro Foursquare Division. He and his family started River Church. The River Church family consists started out with 15 teenagers where he serves as senior pastor. Today, the river has over 350 people. John is an unconventional pastor who teaches love and compassion. Through his passion to mentor and creatively show others how to see their cities differently. Now, prior to the program, I, I asked John, is there anything specific uh, uh, that he would like to, to include in uh, his bio, an introduction, like anything we'd like to say uh, with that, on top of that. And he just said, well, uh, Brother John, that's uh, everything you read, that you're going to read in the bio, uh, that's okay. But simply, I'm just a guy named John who's here to tell my story. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pastor John Wiley. accepted the invitation to be here. Before I give my key remarks regarding the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, I wanted to give you a, an update about the River of Refuge since it was mentioned. It really flows out of a, just seeing our own neighbors who are enrolled in our own school districts, whose children attend with our children, whose families shop in our grocery stores, who we see. We live in one-room motels for years on end. I'm aware of a young man here in our school district who for over 11 years of his life has lived in a motel right here. And so we started advocating for those families one at a time, back before we made the move to buy the former Park Lane Hospital, advocating in onesies, one at a time, because it just what love does. Well, I'm here to say that uh, three or four years down the road of carrying the ball, to get that facility turned and opened. This last year we received a donation of $2.3 million by a local business to put up new roofs. <laughs> Not to include the hundreds of thousands of dollars of donation and tens of thousands of hours of community service that have come right from local members here in this community. And it seems as though the ball for us is on the uh, two-yard line and we're ready to punch it over and, uh, and get the facility open and have our first 11 units. But since we don't finance any of it, and it all comes, when the money shows up, we will move a little further. And meanwhile, while we're rehabbing that facility, simultaneously, the number of families we help is at record highs. So we do two things at once. I'm so excited to tell you that we just received a $1.8 million donation to open the first 11 units by June the 30th of this year. <laughs> On this day, we have gathered to honor the life of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This is a life of love. A life lived 
with such force that 47 years after his murder, both his actions and his words are palpable on the earth today. Hear now Dr. King's words. Hear him say this, I, I have decided to stick with love, for hate is too great a burden to bear. Hear him say these words, let no man, let no man pull you so low as to cause you to hate him. Now where did Dr. King find the baseline for such words as these? For such action, for such courage. Where did that come from? Where did that spring up from within the man himself? And can it be found today? You see, only weak people who allow themselves to be pulled into hate do so. Only cowards recoil to hate. Hatred is a place of cowards. Where did Dr. King find the baseline for the life that he lived? And again, I ask the question, can it be found today? Well, I want to tell you clearly, it's no secret. Where did he find it? It's in plain sight. It's in plain sight for all to see. There it is. To be grasped by anyone, regardless of the color of your skin, whether you are rich or poor, black or white, there it is in plain sight, ready to grab and run with, with the same courage. For the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King found his words in the very words of Jesus. Straight from his words, hear the words of Jesus straight from the heart of God, where he said, but you, to his followers, you, Love your enemies and do good, hoping, hoping for nothing in return. And then your reward will be great, and then you will be called sons of the Most High. There is the baseline. From here, Dr. King found what he needed to rise above hatred. For he found the words in the King of Kings. He goes on. Jesus makes this statement. For he, God the Father, is kind to unthankful and evil people. Therefore, you be merciful, just as your Father also in heaven is merciful. So there it is. He, God, is kind to evil and unthankful people. These words of Jesus are the central dividing line between those who truly understand the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King and those who say they do, but truly, in fact, do not. For Dr. King had a dream, which he articulated poetically and lived with clarity. He grasped this dream from a glimpse into the kingdom of heaven itself. A kingdom where Psalms 85 makes this proclamation. Listen. Mercy and truth have met together and righteousness and peace have kissed. In that kingdom, there is peace and there is righteousness anchored in the truth that all of mankind is created equal and are image bearers made in the image of God. And that all mankind, regardless of the color of their skin, have tremendous value placed on them by God Himself. And that all people, all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, are deserving of dignity, honor, and respect. God's prophet Isaiah proclaimed these words, the same words that Dr. King would read. It says there in Isaiah, the work of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness is quietness and assurance forever. 
At a great cost, Dr. King forged a path making room for his dream of righteousness and peace at a great price. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King gave his life to that dream. And he himself knowing that his dream was found first in the very heart of God himself. So said another way, Dr. King gave himself to the dream of God's own heart. What is that dream? What is God's dream? John the Revelator writes in the book of Revelation these words, that the kingdom of God is comprised of every tribe, of every tongue, of every people. God's dream is for mankind to be one people living in peace and righteousness. So hear now, again, in this assembly, the words of Dr. King. The words of his dream given on August the, August the 28th, 1963. I myself, being only 15 months old. Hear his words. Hear them again. I have a dream. That one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. Of the, of its creed. That we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even in the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering in the heat of injustice, sweltering in the heat of oppression, it will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that one day my four little children will live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its vicious, ra vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with words of interposition and nullification, that one day right down in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers, today, today I have a dream. I have a dream one day that every valley shall be exalted and every mountain shall be made low, that the rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh, all flesh, all flesh shall see it together. find these words to be inspiring and beautiful and the second time we've heard them again in this afternoon. We find them beautiful and inspiring because Dr. K Dr. King grasped this from the very heart of God, our Creator. And they ring true in our hearts. And today on the earth, many others live for this dream. They speak this dream. They live this dream just as Dr. King did. They adhere to his words. These people who embrace this dream are easily discernible on the earth. For you can recognize them by what they do with their lives and what they say with their words. <coughs> Followers of Dr. King, they do not loot. They do not burn other people's property. They are not rude. They are not self-seeking. Rather, those who seek to honor Dr. King live for something bigger than themselves. They seek to give. Dr. King said these words. Life's most persistent and urgent question is this. What are you doing for others? His followers seek to solve problems, not to create them. His followers seek to give dignity, honor, and respect to all people, regardless of their heritage. Dr. King's followers live lives of courage, never allowing wrongs done, either real or perceived, to become justification for ugly and bombastic behavior. Those who seek to honor Dr. King will do as he did. And what did he do? Above all things, Dr. King sought the kingdom of heaven first, above all things. Dr. King surrendered. He surrendered his hurt. He surrendered his pain. 
and the wrong done to him and his people to the king of kings. And he spoke boldly of another day. Hear the words of Dr. King. Hear him say these words. Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a permanent attitude. Hear the words of Dr. King. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. <laughs> to honor Dr. King would be for us also to join him in seeking first God's dream. To honor Dr. King would be for us each individually also to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. To actually seek the kingdom first means to speak the kingdom first, to live the kingdom first. It is so much more than simply acknowledging that the kingdom exists. This world and the kingdom of God is not impacted by what you believe. It is only impacted by what you do with what you believe. By the words that come from your mouth and by the actions of the members of your body. Courageous and bold lives willing to take on risky actions of love and forgiveness when you don't know how it's going to end. Regardless of not knowing, love takes risks. Not knowing, you move forward. For love itself compels you to take a great leap of faith towards someone not like you, who doesn't vote like you, think like you, live like you, or have morals like you. Love compels you forward. Listen to Dr. King's words about faith. Listen to him say this. Faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. Hmm. It takes faith to move towards somebody different than you, with different customs than you, and different beliefs than you. It takes faith. Dr. King is judged today by both his words and his deeds, and we honor him today for the life that he lived. The question becomes... How will you and I be judged? How will you and I be honored? Will we be judged as having lived as cowards? Afraid of those people? You know those people. You know them. The ones that make you feel uncomfortable. The ones who don't vote like you. You know those people, your brothers, your sisters, the ones we must guard ourselves from trash talking, those people. We are all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, but we are all sons and daughters of the Most High God. It is not suggested to us that we love our brothers and sisters, those people. We are commanded to do so. And those who refuse the command, who find justification for hatred and prejudice in their heart, will find themselves embarrassed as the day of God's kingdom approaches, a day when all things will be restored as they should be. I started this speech with the words of Jesus. And now as I end, I believe as Dr. Cain would want it, I shall end with the words of Jesus. But you, love your enemies. You, do good. You, live. And do it hoping for nothing in return. And then your reward will be great. And that you will be the sons and daughters of the Most High. For he, God your Father, is kind. He is kind to unthankful and evil people. Therefore, be merciful, 
Judge not the evil and unthankful, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not the evil and unthankful, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive the evil and unthankful, and you shall be forgiven. Give to the evil and unthankful, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, poured into your bosom. For with whatever measure you use toward the evil and unthankful, that measurement will be measured back to you. So, Father, creator of heaven and earth, hear our confession and hear our prayer. Your kingdom come. And the way you want it be done. Here on earth, as it's already mapped out in your heart in heaven. And with courage, we ourselves yield, like Dr. King, to forge a new way of love, dignity, and respect. Thank you for the honor of allowing me to be with you. My name is Al Brown. I am the director of the Ray County Emergency Assistance Program, Akron and Missouri. Oftentimes people ask me, what do we do, who do we serve, and what is Marie all about? Well, REAP helps about 450 kids each year with new shoes, new backpacks, and school supplies so they can start the school year off like everybody else. The Raytown School District has a program called the Snack Pack Program, which uh, we get food, we box it up, package it up, and give it to the schools. In turn, the kids, elementary and some middle school kids, every Friday afternoon on their way home, they get the snack pack. It's five pounds of food that's supposed to last them for the entire weekend. Keep in mind, some of these kids, this is the only food they are going to receive for that weekend. <coughs> One of our biggest outreaches in the Raytown Emergency Program is our food pantry. We give out between 15 and 18,000 items of food each month. We help around 300 families. Um, and right now, our food pantry is basically empty. We could probably hold in 50 to 60,000 items of food to pass out to the people in need. Right now, we probably do not have any more than three to 4,000 items out there. The amount of food we have in our pantry right now can only serve X amount of people for just a few days. It happens because once the holiday season is over, warm and fuzzies don't take place. It's not as much fun to give food on March the 15th as it is December the 23rd. But people forget that people in need are hungry 24-7, 365. If everybody who lives in the Raytown C2 School District, that's 60,000 people who live in our area, if each one of those people would give me one can of food a month and one dollar a month, nobody would be hungry and nobody's lights, gas, water, sewer, all those type expenses that we help people with would be an issue. And the most important thing, nobody would miss that one dollar or that one can of food. The people who come to REAP are people just like you. Their consumers, their neighbors, and their friends. And of course, the need for food is always there. We give out far more food than comes in, and we can always need everybody's help. So do not think that your small donation will not make a difference because it will. this afternoon and I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward at this time. What I would like you to do this afternoon is consider the things that you've heard. Uh, we talked a little bit about giving today uh, even in our worship services and it's true. I'm going to ask you to give money now. You're not going to get anything in return except the opportunity to help your neighbor. 
Except the opportunity to help somebody who lives next door to you or in that motel that you passed on your way in. The money you give today is going to go to two organizations. The first is community outreach. I drive by community outreach every day when I come home from work. And I think about who is Queen Mother helping today? And REAP, the uh, organization you just heard about earlier. And what they say is true. It's January. We're all at the gym. We're not... <laughs> well, not all of us are at the gym, but... But we stop thinking about that. So I want to encourage you to be generous today. If you write a check, write that check out to Graceway. I promise we're not keeping it. We're going to send it to the bank and they're going to cut it in half. And half's going to go to REAP and half's going to go to community outreach. So today you can do cash or check. As these buckets come by as we sing a song, would you be generous? Would you think about your neighbor? And Summer, I want to start. generous this afternoon and enjoy the prayer of St. Francis.
Thank you, Jeremy, Shell, and choir for singing. My name is Pastor Ron Haley. I'm one of the pastors here at Graceway. I just want to say this. I love to hear Queen Mother sing. And um, I've had the opportunity to be a part of this event for past, the past three years now. And I remember the first time I, I heard her sing, Have You Seen My Old Friend Martin? And so, somewhere in the neighborhood of about four years ago, Graceway, as a church, really wanted to be involved in the community and be a part of what was done on an annual basis for the Martin Luther King celebration. And Donna Bruce and I were a part of the outreach group at that time, and we started to talk about what we really wanted to do and how we could be a part of our community and the celebration that took place. We came up with this thing and we said, well, let's, let's have an essay writing contest and call it MLK Today. Now that contest was to respond to what Queen Mother says when she sings that song that you heard at the beginning. When she says, have you seen my old friend Martin? And we begin to think about this and we said, we've seen Martin in a lot of places. But so often we walk by Martin and we do not even notice him. See, Mayor Bauer has given the last eight years of his life helping to fulfill the dream of what Martin believed, and that is to give your life to public service, not really looking for anything in return. That is Martin. When you think about Queen Mother and what she does through community outreach, when she looks to go and feed people and see homelessness erased and to help people find dignity, you have seen Martin today. When you think about Al Brown who opens up an organization like Reap and they build an entire building with the hands of volunteers and begin to feed a community, you have seen Martin today. You drive by a building and you see it has been vacated and it could just become a, a, a blight on that community. But instead, you become John Wiley and you hear from God and you say, you know what? I could be Martin today and open that place back up and begin to erase homelessness completely because I have a dream. And so when you hear the statement, MLK today, it means a lot more than just a sign up in front of you. It is a call for you to be marked here and now, today. Look to your, part, your neighbor and say, I will be MLK today. Let me hear you say it louder. I will be MLK today. I'll sit back and watch the world pass you by. Because it is truly better to give than to receive. You want to experience true joy? Begin to figure out a way you can give away your whole entire life. Because then you'll see what it's all about. What's who Martin was? To give a speech the night before he died and say, I may not see the promised land with you. That is a person who has surrendered. So I want to read you some statements and some things from my 2014 campaign for children. These are young people in the Raytown School District who begin to write essays. And what we challenged them with was, first of all, learn a little bit about who Martin is. See, I thank you guys for the people who were here long before us, long before Grace, we got involved and they were doing this MLK Today celebration. Because we need not forget who Martin was. And so we asked them to write an essay and just to kind of tell us a little bit about Martin and, and who he was. And so they'll write an essay and they'll talk a little bit about that. But then we challenged them to say, would you be Martin today? So we asked them to, to, to write down a project that they would like to see done in the community. And then to be a part of that project to do something that Martin would be doing right now today. And you can do what Martin would be doing today in so many small ways. And sometimes in really big ways. So last year, 
our winner of the contest was Princess Simmons. She was a seventh grader. And here's what Simmons wrote. I envision a service project to commemorate Dr. King's legacy. I believe providing service to families at Community Link, a transitional housing program for homeless families, would be what Mark would be doing today. So Community Link and John is very familiar with those guys because the River Refuge works as a partnership with them. They literally, this is amazing, they literally now, they take a family who is homeless and they shorten the time frame. Within 90 days, some of those families are in their own homes or they have their own houses and they are completely out of homelessness and they have like an 80 something, 90 something percent success rate where those families never return. So we took a Princess Simmons said, yes, amen. So Princess Simmons was the award winner last year, so we took what she said to heart. We, um, we gave her a prize, of course, and then we asked her to be involved as we did some things too. So in June, we collected household items. We filled a large box trailer with furniture, computers, and bikes, and we delivered that to Community Link. In October, we supported their annual rent party and a team also helped with registration. And that rent party is how they raise funds. And so um, Community Week is an organization that's a nonprofit, and so we helped them raise funds, and, and we were a part of that initiative with them. And they call it a rent party, which is kind of cool in itself, right? And so they, they raised funds to, to help take care of their organization for the next year. In October, our staff here at Graceway, we went and we painted buildings down at Community Week, and we painted fences, and we were a part of that. We now have a team committed to help set up apartments as they prepare for the arrival of new families. See, new families are always moving into Community Link, and so what we wanted to see happen was, you know how when you move into a new house, we wanted to see people feel very welcome. So when they came into that apartment, and they had previously been homeless, and that apartment was furnished, that they would walk in and see things that would welcome them into that house. And their child's room decorated in a certain way, certain items already there in the fridge, and, things like that. So we have a, a team that's committed to that. And you guys can still be a part of that too, of the Community Link organization. You can simply call our, our church or you can reach out and just find Community Link right there on the internet. So this year we went back out and we said, where is Martin today? We want to find some more students who look like Martin Luther King and what he would be doing today. So I'm going to ask, as we always do, for Mayor Bauer to come up and tower over the students. <laughs> <laughs> I like when the students come up because they make me at least look bigger. It's all perspective. <laughs> you know, when you watch like a basketball player in the NBA and you're looking at a guy and you go, he looks really little, but he's like 6'4". It's just because he's next to seven foot guys. And I'm like 6'3". No, I'm not. <laughs> I shouldn't lie, I'm a pastor and I'm in church. <laughs> I want to call up three students and I hope they're here with us. Rebecca Bottoms, please come up to the stage. She's here with us. <laughs> Arena Flores. Very young, 
Martin Luther King today, fourth grade, Fleet Ridge mm. Elementary. Miss Rebecca Bottoms. See, see, someone told me, they said, she will have no fear whatsoever. <laughs> I said, she is a girl after my own heart. I love a microphone, all right? I have two loves in life, Jesus Christ and a microphone. Okay. <laughs>
what's going to happen. Oh!